Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this evening's event uh, from the Jesus College Intellectual Forum. My name is Julian Huppert. I'm the director of the Intellectual Forum. And it's been great to run a whole series of events uh, for the Cambridge Festival. It's been quite a monster of a week. Uh, we've had events on pretty much anything you can think of, from technology and care survivors to romanticism at the Black Atlantic to an amazing science quiz show in this room where one of our other physicists was wisecracking um, and generally educating people about science. So it's been really quite a special week, um, and we're delighted to have this as our final event. Now, some of you I know are very familiar with Jesus College, but for some of you this may be your first time here. So if, you're, if you don't know this area, um, you're very welcome in Jesus in real life or virtually. Um, we have an amazing history as a college, uh, originally set up in 1144 as a nunnery, turned into a college in 1496 by Bishop Alcock, um, and we have had a huge number of people who've gone on to change the way thinking happens. Um, everyone from Thomas Cranmer, who, who was in, quite involved with religious change, Malthus, who spoke about population, Lisa Jardine, Clean Bandit, some of you may know Rockaby. Yes, I said, at least somebody is, is, is up with the modern trends. Lewis Pugh, who's been swimming the world's oceans, and many, many, many others. Um, it really is an amazing college, and we're delighted uh, that you're here. The Intellectual Forum was set up a few years ago to try to get people to think and talk about interesting things and to reach outside the boundaries of our own college. And so it's wonderful to have people here for these. We've done lots of events over the years, almost all of which are available on YouTube. So um, if you would like to catch up with any of the ones that you've missed... Uh, please do. They are, they are all there and freely available. But tonight it's really wonderful to welcome one of our own fellows to speak. Ulrich is no stranger here. Um, he has, I think this is the third event he's done for the Cambridge Festival. One of them, there was a pandemic. I don't know if you heard about it. It sort of hit the news for a bit. Um, but the very first one, he was the very first person to ever do an experiment in this amazing Frank Pan Hall. And he cooled a small part of it to a temperature below that of outer space. So if you think outer space is cold, you should have been here then, or maybe stepped back a little bit. He's professor of many body physics because single bodies are very passe. Newton did single bodies. Um, so, you know, Ulrich is moving well beyond uh, Newton and doing some really amazing work to work out how these ultra-cold atoms that are, in some cases, so cold they may even have a negative temperature or an infinite temperature, depending how you count it, um, can actually be used uh, for measurements. So it's wonderful to have you with us, Ulrich. I'll hand over to you to speak, and then we'll have some discussion afterwards. So thank you for being with us. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you all for coming. It's, as usual, a pleasure being here. There will be no experiments tonight because the experiment that we propose to build, the one you can see on the right-hand side, will in the first iteration be 10 meters high, then 100 meters, and then a kilometer high. So I think this hall is spacious, but maybe not as like outer space. So I will talk about very small things, and then in the very end come to very, very big things. So the small things were for a long, long time the smallest things uh, conceivable. Atoms. Atomos, the old Greek word, says the undividable. Thinking if you take a block of metal or a piece of glass, you can always cut it into smaller and smaller pieces. But eventually this will stop when you've reached like a single atom because you can't divide a single atom later, uh, any further. Of course, 2,000 years later, we realized that's not the case and we got like nuclear fusion, nuclear fission, and all of those things. But for a long time, that was what everything was about, the atom. Now, for 2,000 years, people also didn't really know how to describe the atom. That's why it's just a pure, boring blue dot. And then, of course, uh, also here in Cambridge, Thomson discovered the electron. Later on, they discovered that there must be a nucleus, which is much, much smaller, and how all of those things come together. Then, in the beginning of the 20th century, Bohr and Rutherford and others came up with like, a model for the atom, where they were basically saying the atom has like, a core, a nucleus, which is now not to scale, but much, much smaller, with neutrons and protons on the inside. And then the electrons arranged in these kind of shells or wave functions, as we will talk about them now, outside it. And I guess many people would have seen this in school and they would think of, yes, an electron is like a, so, uh, an atom is like a solar system where the electron is circling through the, around the, uh, the core. And that picture is wrong. Even though you still see here in an old picture, you still see like the arrows saying it's moving in this case. It's not really true. The modern picture we now have of an atom is boring again because it looks like this. We're basically saying there's in the middle, there's the core. And the core itself is a bit fuzzy. There's a wave function, there's a certain size to it which is like indicated by like the uh, upper part, like femtometer scale. And then the electron is somewhere in a cloud around this 
unlike a scale that's like on the order of an angstrom, which is 10 to the minus 10 meters. So pretty small still. But it's like not such a mechanical, simple object. It's something more complicated. And understanding why it is and how it is more complicated, that this te te did, did teach us a lot about fundamental physics. And now that we understand it, we can use it to like learn things about even more physics, about the cosmos and about everything. So the story starts, like every story in Cambridge with Newton. So basically the idea, one of the things that Newton did was he was also looking at optics. So he was realizing that if you take a prism, like a triangular piece of glass, and you like hold it in the right angle to the sunlight, the white light that comes in on the inside, you will see the different colors coming out on the right-hand side which basically means you can like take sunlight and split it up into all of its colors. And white light is the sum of all colors. And what Newton didn't know, but what you can see from this animation, is that like, the red light has like, the longest wavelength, the longest distance between one maximum and the next maximum, while like, the blue and the ultraviolet light has the shortest wavelength. And we can use this to split these different lights and interact with the light with various different ways. So this came, this passed, like about 100, 150 years later, People were looking at this with like better prisms, better apparatuses to like separate like the white light into the different parts. And then they looked at the sun, and then they saw something interesting that happened in the UK, William Wallenstein, and also in Germany, Josef von Fraunhofer. They saw when they look at the spectrum from the sun, you can see the whole rainbow there from the ultraviolet to the dark red. What they saw is peculiar black lines in there. So somehow it's not like the continuous glow that you would expect from like a thermal light source to have. It has these very sharp dips in it where light is missing. And the question is, where does this come from? What can you have that really like, uh, emits or absorbs light at these discrete frequencies? And well, the answer came about again later, and the answer is basically the atoms. Basically, the atomic structure gives rise to these discrete orbits where the electron can be just in one state or another state or yet another state. And if the electron jumps from one orbit to the other one, say from the one with n equal 3 to n equal 2, it emits light with a very particular wavelength, with a very particular color. And that color is directly given by the energy difference between the energy states before and after. And because they are discrete states, it makes sense that each atom can only like, absorb and emit light at some discrete frequencies. And that then finally was the explanation for what people saw in these solar spectra more than a century earlier. And the observation of these solar spectra, of these discrete lines there, was very, very important for understanding how atoms work for understanding quantum physics. It's basically one of the big experimental efforts that led us to this point to say, actually, some things are not continuous. You can't go with an arbitrary speed. They must be discrete. You can be here or there or there, but nowhere in between. And that's exactly what you see in the atoms. And that's exactly what atomic physics was all about, trying to understand this physics and trying to see what was going on. So this was one of the main successes of early quantum mechanics. And coming back to real life, you could ask yourself, have I ever seen this? And if you've been driving in the night through, say, France or Belgium, you will have seen this. You probably know that the streetlights in Belgium have this peculiar yellowish-orange color. And probably you never wondered where it came from. But now I can tell you that's because these are sodium vapor lamps. There's like a vapor inside of one particular atom, sodium. And the D lines, the famous D lines, the one in the orange up there, which are already very, very visible in the solar spectrum there and also here, oh, sorry, here, these are the lines that are like the most prominent lines, and those lines are used in the sodium vapor lamps to illuminate the street at night. So you see quantum physics at least every night, at least in Belgium. Okay, so now we know that we have the atoms, and that these atoms have these discrete energy levels, which we level like one, two, three, and so on. And of course, we didn't stop there. What scientists then did is they like developed better and better methods to probe the light, to look at which colors are absorbed and very, very precisely measure the wavelength of that light. And then here's a simple histogram of what happens. When you look at this, first up there, in the first line, if you just take a very coarse description, the one that Bohr and people already knew about in the 19th century, then you get like one energy level, say the one with n equal 2. If you then look a little bit later in the quantum mechanics, you realize there should actually be more than one level in there because you should have it split up by like special relativity and other effects. That's what you get here. We get a 2s and a 2p level. And those states now differ by their angular momentum. So in the p state, the electron is really orbiting around the nucleus in, the, in an s state not. It's still like a wave function, but it kind of has an angular momentum to it. And then you could have stopped there, but a few decades later with better technology, people could like look even more carefully. And they saw that these two lines there, 
split up even further. They got like the spin orbit coupling, the Darwin term. They got more and more effects coming into play. Zeeman structure, hyperfine structures, just by looking more precisely, by measuring more precisely, in some sense using an atom as a quantum sensor for quantum mechanics, they could like see more and more details and had to like develop the theory further and further and further. And basically like our understanding of how do the electrons look in an atom, nowadays looks roughly like this. You might have seen these uh, pictures in your A-levels in physics or chemistry. What you see here is just the mathematical solution of those equations, which is printed up there telling us how do these different orbitals look. What is like the distribution of the atoms, of the electrons within an atom if it's in a 1s state, a 2s state, the one that we saw in the previous slide, which is the upper left corner, or in something, say, a little bit more elaborate. And there's a lot of symmetry and beauty in there, and actually symmetry is some of the things that people have discovered by looking at those things, that symmetry and very simple counting arguments are very important if you want to understand nature. By one reason or the other, nature likes to be beautiful, even in the mathematics. So, fast forward again a little bit, and then a new tool comes about, lasers. With lasers, you can suddenly generate a lot of light of precisely one color, just one single frequency, as we call it. And with laser spectroscopy, you can then go on and measure things even better. And what can you use this for? Well, you can use this, for instance, to measure more complicated things. A lot of what we know about molecules, molecular binding and how molecules move, we know from molecular spectroscopy, which we now can do because we have laser sources that we can scan through and measure all of this forest of lines that the molecule has. We can look at things like isotope shifts. So if you put one neutron more or less in the atom, the chemical properties are almost the same. But because the nucleus is a little bit more heavier or a bit lighter, the frequencies, the resonance frequencies, are ever so slightly shifted. And these isotope shifts you can use now to separate different isotopes and measure them of the, say, of the same atom. So for instance, when you heard carbon dating, where somebody looks at like an old fossil and says by the ratio between carbon-12 and carbon-13 in there, we can say that this must have been created 1,000 years or 10,000 years or 100,000 years in the past. Those kind of methods are used there. You can go further. You can like look more fundamental things, lamp shift, tests of quantum electrodynamics, the most precise theory we have. And what people can nowadays do is they can measure transition frequencies with like many, many, many digits, 15, 18 digits and more. So let me just give you one example. Well, okay, the same principle, measuring more precisely uncovers new physics. Let me just give you one example from like a few years ago, which was making quite a bit of head waves at the time. The question is, if I really look at a realistic model of the atom, and this is still not to scale, the electron orbit, like the blue line is where the electron would sit, is even bigger and further away from this proton in the middle than there. But the proton is also a little bit fuzzy. It has a certain size to it. It's not just a point. The proton consists of like quarks inside, and they're moving around in a complicated dance with all of the gluons and everything, and that has a certain distribution to it. And you can ask what is the width of this distribution. That's what we call the proton charge radius. And up to 2010, everybody agreed that it was like 0.8768 femtometers. It's a very small number. I don't know it by heart. It's not so important. But it's a very small number, but people thought they knew it to like two or three significant digits. Then in 2010, somebody made a clever experiment where they basically said, let's go on and replace the electron in some, in some um, hydrogen, in the simplest type of atom, with a muon, which is like, if you know particle physics, it's like a heavier cousin of the electron. It's unstable, it doesn't live very long, but otherwise it's just like an electron, but heavier, a couple hundred times heavier. So what happens is that in muonic hydrogen, the muon will be much, much, much closer to the proton because it's heavier, so the orbit will look different. So of course, the frequencies will be very different. And they said, oh, let's measure those frequencies and compare them to the prediction to see whether there's any small shift or whether everything agrees with the theory as it should. And then they measured and saw nothing. They didn't find the transition. And they had like a measurement campaign because you can't have muons in your lab. You have to go to a special facility. But they got like a few weeks of measurement time. They set the experiment up and they saw nothing. People said, ah, oh, don't worry. It's a good idea. Come back later with a better experiment. Try it again. And the, the main person, Randolph Pohl, he was in Munich at the time, so we overlapped there, and he was telling the story. He was this close of ending his career there and then, because he said, like, we were on the last day of the last measurement run. If he wouldn't have measured anything here, total failure, my career would have been over. And at that point, kind of out, for, out of frustration, they were saying, well, the line must be here. They were measuring from here to there. And really, on the last day of the measurement campaign, they just continued measuring, just for the sake of it, because whatever, there's nothing else to do. And then over here, suddenly, shebang, they saw the line, very far away from what they expected it. And the reason is that if they now calculated from their transition what the size of the proton should be, 
they get 0.84184. So you see, instead of a four in the second digit, uh, they have a four in the second digit instead of the, the, the seven there. So it's almost 10% or 5% off, which, if I look at the uncertainties we have, is a five sigma discrepancy. And if you know your particle physics, five sigma is a threshold for a real discovery. So it's impossible that this was just like a random chance. There must be something wrong, there must be something fishy. And people got very excited about it for like a couple of years saying, oh, if the proton has a different size than how we calculate the size of the proton, how we extract this, how we look at this, something must be wrong here. And everybody, the theorists, got very excited about new physics, a new theory, a fifth force, whatever you can throw at this, everything. It turns out, most likely, the explanation in this case is more mundane. There were, was just something done wrong in the initial preparation, in the initial extraction of this radius, so no exciting physics, just like we now know things more carefully. And that's like something that's always like a point for cause. If I say I can measure now a frequency for not five digits, not 10 digits, but 15, but 20 digits, the question always comes up, <laughs> why should I? I don't care about this frequency that precisely. You all are happy to know that the proton is around the femtometer. Do you care whether it's like 5% smaller or bigger? Well, we care because whether it's 5% smaller or bigger can tell us a lot about the underlying physics. So it's not such that we are saying we just want more numbers, we always have like a motivation of why we want these numbers for. So I'm now going to tell you where we want to like measure things to 20 digits of precision. I will also tell you the reason why we want to. Okay, so um, next step, we now have to like mentally change gears a little bit. When we were talking about the light, we were talking about the wavelengths, we were talking about how fast the light then oscillates, the frequency of the light. But well, the frequency is just one over the period. It's one over the, t the inverse of the time, how long it takes to do something. If you have a frequency of one hertz, it means I do one oscillation in one second. A frequency of two hertz means an oscillation is only half a second. So if I'm talking about frequency or I'm talking about time, it's ultimately the same thing, just the inverse. And if I now think about this, how do I measure time? Well, you measure time with a clock. And the original one typical clock was presented by Huygens in the 1650s, was the idea of a pendulum clock, where you basically take a big pendulum, which is just swinging back and forth, and we can calculate very precisely how long it will take, and that gives us like at the clock, tick, talk, tick, talk. And many, some of you will probably still have like a grandfather's clock at their home. And this is all perfectly fine for everyday use. But the problem that came up is the following. The period of such a clock is proportional to the, uh, to the square root of the length of the pendulum. If the pendulum is longer, the clock ticks slower. If it's shorter, the clock ticks faster. So we could say, well, okay, I just like, have my master clock, the one that I trust, I put the new clock next to it, and I make this pendulum shorter or longer until they tick at the same rate. That's fine, right? The problem then comes if I now take this clock, go home, put it next to my oven where it's a bit hotter, it heats up a little bit, so the pendulum gets longer. So my clock now suddenly goes slower. And that's very bad if you want to like, compare things internationally. How can you make sure that you have the same time here than you have in the US or whatnot, where the conditions are very different? But still, you can, of course, make this better. You can think of, okay, let's take this pendulum, put it in like a vacuum chamber maybe, so there's no air around it, no air friction and so on, and then temperature stabilize it. And actually, like the best version of a pendulum clock, it's this one here, was the official US time standard from 1909 to 1929, less than 100 years ago. So pendulum clocks are quite good, but especially the British, of course, wanted to move beyond that because the pendulum clock does not really work well on sea. And you need very accurate clocks on sea to know what the time is, because if you know what the time is and where the stars are in the sky, you know where you are on the ocean. So therefore, they developed other types of clock where they used like little springs instead of uh, pendulums. But the principle is the same. In a clock, I need something that oscillates with a certain period, a certain frequency. And if that period or that frequency is very well defined and cannot be perturbed by anything, then I have a good clock. So yeah, you can ask what will be the best clock in the world. And well, the answer right now by definition is an atom. And I say by definition because time, the second, is now defined via atoms. The official definition of a second is that the second is defined by taking the fixed numerical value of the cesium frequency in cesium-133 to be 9 billion, 192 millions, and so on, when expressed in units of hertz, which is equal to one second. So we're basically saying there's this one thing we can measure very carefully, which is this one frequency in cesium, and we just define the second to be so long that it gives us exactly this frequency. And why is this great? This is great because nobody now ever has to go and compare two clocks and bring the clock from here to there or whatnot, 
because all cesium atoms everywhere in the world, everywhere in the universe, are identical. So if I now have somebody in, on Mars, I can tell them measure this frequency in the atom and they know exactly what my definition of a second is. All atoms are identical. It's always exactly the same frequency. And it turns out it's also very practical because with the best cesium clocks nowadays, this is one at NIST, they get relative uncertainties of 10 to the minus 16. So you have to wait 10 to the 16 seconds for the clock to be by one second off. And now again, people could come and say, well, why do I care? If I lose a second a day in everyday life, you would think it doesn't matter. Well, it turns out, probably most of you, or quite a few of you, will have used an atomic clock on the way of getting here. Because clocks like this, not as precise, but therefore much, much more compact, they are the central point, they are on board on every GPS satellite. So what happens with the GPS satellites is that they fly around the Earth, and they basically always broadcast their local time. They always at every time send out a signal, my time is this, my time is that. Your phone receives the signal, if you look at Google Maps, and it realizes that the timestamp you get from this satellite is earlier than the timestamp you get from that satellite. And because everything flies with the speed of light, you realize you must be closer to this satellite than to this satellite. And if you know the distance to three or four of those satellites, you know precisely where you are on Earth. So we all have used, or most of us will have used, an atomic clock today. And we don't need the 16 digits, but we need like quite a few more digits than you would get from a grandfather's clock to make the system work. And if we could get better clocks up there, then we could also make GPS work with millimeter or centimeter accuracy, which would be very nice if you like, say, measuring out a plot for building a new house. You don't have to measure relative to something with all of that. You just go there with GPS and say, here I am, up to a millimeter. Here I am, up to a millimeter. So with better clocks, we can make these things simply better. Okay. Now, is this the best possible clock? The answer is no, not by far. The problem is that this frequency, which is 9 gigahertz, so it's slightly higher, a few times higher than the, the, the frequency of the microwave oven you have at home, it's quite a big frequency, but it's a very small frequency compared to the frequency of light. And of course, if I have the same relative stability, I can get like a faster clicking clock, it will be more accurate, more precise. So therefore, what you want to do is, you want to go to an um, atomic optical clock, where you again use laser light to interrogate atoms. And you now have to be a bit creative and find the right atom for doing so, because these atomic states, they have this uh, unfortunate property that they will always decay down. When you put atoms, make them very hot, they fluoresce, they emit light. And this fluorescence means that the electron in there jumps back to the lower level and thereby emits its energy. So you need to find an atom that does almost not fluoresce, and these atoms exist. One that's typically used is uh, strontium. And strontium, you have like two outer electrons. And if they're in one configuration, they're very, very weakly coupled to another configuration. This is very hard for us, in a sense, because it means we have to push them a lot to get them there. But it also means they don't like it to fall back. So they can be very stable there. And we can do a lot of interesting physics with these electrons in there. And for what comes next, we should maybe understand in a slight little bit more detail how such an atomic clock works. And actually, it's rather, uh, it's, it's rather simple. When you think about it in the representation that we use as a physicist, we say, okay, well, we excite the atoms up to like a mixture superposition of two states. Then we let it freely evolve. And then we try to excite it further and see whether it works or not. And if you want to understand this, the analogy, just think of somebody on a swing. You're standing behind the swing, and you start pushing them in a certain rhythm. And of course, Every time you push them, they get more energy because you push them always in phase. You push them forward when they're going forward, and you excite them more and more every time they swing a bit higher. And then after doing this a few times, you stop. or You don't stop, but you just walk away, but you keep doing this for a long, long time. You keep doing this in exactly the same rhythm. And then you come back without changing the rhythm and start pushing again. If you have now held your rhythm very precisely, and you were really pushing in the same rhythm that they were swinging, then you're still in phase with them. So when they're swinging forwards, you push them forwards, so you excite them even further. But if you got your, 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 your frequency a bit off, a bit wrong, then they might be on the way back when you want to push them forwards, so you will de-excite them. So you do the sequence. You try to excite them for a while, what we call a pi over two pulse. You wait for a long time, excite again with another pi over two pulse, and then see whether you have excited them further or not. And that will tell you whether these two frequencies were the same. And that's how an atomic clock works. Was worth two Nobel Prizes. <laughs> okay, so how good can such a clock now be? What we do in such a clock is we like take 
a whole bunch of atoms, a big cloud of atoms, and we interrogate them with a laser beam. And then if the laser beam is seen to be a bit too fast, we turn it down a bit. If it's seen to be too slow, we turn it up a bit. <coughs> and then we do this many, many times over and over and over. And now I would really love a laser pointer. What you see now in this plot on the vertical axis is what's called the fractional frequency uncertainty. And the logarithmic scale, 10 to the minus 18, 19, 20. What you basically see here is that if you measure for a long, long time and always correct the errors from the laser, then the error goes down and you can measure very, very precisely. You can now measure something 10 to the minus 20 fractional uncertainty, which means if this would be the definition of time, this clock would only go wrong one second after 10 to the 20 seconds. So it's four orders of magnitude better than the best cesium clocks. However, it's not really a clock because time is defined to be the cesium thing, which we can't measure that precisely. So what we have to do is we have to, in this case, for instance, measure two of those things against each other and see how stable they are. And the maybe most interesting part in this paper where they showed this is like something a few pages further back where they asked, okay, what can go wrong? What are like all of the systematic effects that we have to take into account when we try to calculate the frequency we get out of this? And then here you can see what they have to take into account. And if I want to summarize this up in one word, they have to account everything. If there's a magnetic field, well, the atom, the electron is charged, has a spin, has a magnetic moment, will couple to the magnetic field. This will shift the energies ever so slightly. <coughs> the same thing for an electric field. The same thing for like the thermal radiation, the infrared radiation that we all have if we're like in a finite temperature environment, which is called the black body radiation. So anything from the outside world that comes to the atom will shift this frequency ever, ever so slightly. And that's basically now where I'm saying an atom, now that we understand how the atom works in principle, is an excellent quantum sensor. It can see all of those effects in the environment. It can measure magnetic fields, electric fields. It can measure if it's accelerated, so if you put it in a truck or something. It can measure all of those things because they will all lead to a small change in frequency. And that can be your signal if you want to build a quantum sensor. Or like for the people in the clock here, it can be a bad idea because they have to shield all of this away. So they know that they have to like, make magnetic shields around it, electric shields around it, that they shield the atom from all of those influences. But there's, of course, one influence that we cannot shield. There's one force of nature that we cannot shield whatever we want to do. Anyone has an idea what that might be? Gravity, hmm? gravity yes. So we can't shield gravity. And indeed, what happens in this case is that you see the atomic, the atomic distribution here on the left-hand side. The cloud is elongated in the vertical direction by like a millimeter. And they now do something where they measure the blue part, the upper part, versus the red part, versus the lower part. And what they see, because you can't shield gravity, they see a gravitational redshift. Einstein showed in general relativity that if you have a gravitational potential, that also changes how fast time flows. And indeed, if they measure this over several days, like each data dot here is now a measurement done on one date, where they're asking, is the blue one faster than the red one or slower? And you see the data is pretty scattered around because, well, it's really at the limit of what they can do, so they get statistical fluctuations and all of that. But if they measure for, like, say, 10 days, and they average, the average is this red line in the middle. And if you forget about the left-hand side, you look at the right-hand side, the gravitational acceleration that corresponds to this, well, the red line is pretty close to the, to the um, sorry, the, the black line is pretty close to the red line, which is this 9.81 meter per second squared that probably some of you will, re will still remember from school. That's the gravity that we live in, the gravity on Earth. So we could now measure the effect of gravity with an atom interferometer over just one millimeter distance. And now we could say, well, that's the most expensive and most complicated way ever to measure gravity that we just throw a ball like Newton did or an apple and then there and have the same thing. That's of course true, but the interesting thing here is that we can measure many, many more things with this. So we can try to ask, is there also like interesting effects of gravity that we can go and want to measure with this? And this here? Oh, yeah. Uh, one small thing to say is clocks are great, but clocks are really designed to like average over a lot of things and then get to very great precisions. They're ideal for static properties, like the gravity on Earth is not really changing much. If they want to measure something dynamical, something that's oscillating up and down, for instance, then a clock is bad because it takes this long averaging time to really get to this resolution. But there is something that we can do about this. But for this, we again have to like, change our mental model. We talked about oscillations. Now let's talk about waves. Waves, you all know, the simplest example is water waves. 
It's like a perturbance of something that then just propagates through in space with a certain wavelength and a certain frequency and a certain speed. You can have like meta um, classical meta waves where really mass is moving, like in water waves, or like longitudinally you can have like something like sound waves, which is just a pressure wave in air. Or you can of course also have earthquakes where like a solid wave travels to the earth. And everything that you have, everything that you can represent as what we call a field, can have wave-like excitations. The most well-known ones are like the electromagnetic field, which will have like electromagnetic waves, which go all the way from the radio waves that we used for like a, yeah, radio, microwaves, infrared, the visible light, ultraviolet light, X-rays, gamma rays. These are all just electromagnetic waves. And then again, we can ask what other force is there. There's gravity with the gravitational field. So we should also have something called gravitational waves. And indeed, they do exist. And the question is then, how can we measure them? And now already you can already see where this is going to, how we can measure those using ultra-cold atoms. Before we get there, we should maybe ask quickly, how can I create a wave? How can I like, make an emitter that emits a wave? Well, the easiest thing to create a wave is that if you take your medium, you have to wiggle on one end. If you like, take water and you push on the water, you will create a wave that goes out. If you have a stone dropping into water, a wave will revel out. So it's pretty simple. If you take like waves in air, well, you have loudspeakers, which just pushes the air at one end, compresses, decompresses the air, and this perturbation travels through and gives you your sound wave. If you want to like create an electromagnetic wave, like a radio emitter, well, you take a current, send it into an antenna, and the electrons in the antenna go back and forth, back and forth, oscillating, and that gives you like, you wiggle on one end of the electromagnetic field, and it gives rise to a wave that travels through. So how can I then generate a gravity wave? Well, in some sense, it's very, very simple. I just take a mass, like my arm, wiggle it up and down, and this will emit gravity waves. The theory tells us it will. Unfortunately, they are so weak that we can't really see them, measure them, nor notice them. Or maybe that's a good thing. So if I want to like, make big ones, ones that I can really see, I have to think about how can I use the biggest masses that we have and move them around quite violently and quickly around each other. <coughs> and here the answer is, of course, that's nothing that we want to do on Earth. Devastating side effects. We look for astrophysics, and basically the main point of gravitational waves, the biggest source we have at the moment that we've already observed, are like spiraling black holes. So you take two black holes, two of those insanely heavy objects in outer space, and if they're all sitting there in the background, then it's just a static situation, nothing is happening. But of course, they will be attracted to each other. So they will come like this, and eventually merge. But very often they are moving initially, have like initial velocity. And if the initial velocity is not head on, but kind of like this, they would like to move past each other, but then they attract each other by gravity, so they get into like a spiraling motion where they spiral around each other, tumble, and then get closer and closer and closer until they finally fall into themselves. So that's one of those things that we would try to like observe. And if we want to observe wave phenomena, the typical best sensor for this is interferometers. So a classical example that maybe some of you have seen before is a Michelson interferometer. This is now for light. What we do is we take like a source of light, say a laser field on the left. The light is coming in, you see the oscillation, the wave is going up and down, up and down, up and down. Then in the middle, there's a beam splitter, so some of the light goes through to the, to, to the right, another part of the light goes up to the top. At these mirrors at the end, the light gets reflected, goes back to the beam splitter, and then some of the light goes through to the detector here. And the situation that we have plotted there is not a situation where the waves coming back from both mirrors are in phase, which means they interfere constructively. Valley comes on valley, uh, valley comes on valley, hill comes on hill, so the hills get higher and the valleys get deeper. You get a big amplitude here at your detector. Now what happens if this mirror moves a little bit? You get a phase shift on one of the waves, which means you can get to the situation where the two waves coming in here are now destructively interfering. The one has like the valley, the other one has the hill, plus, plus, minus gives zero, and then you see nothing in the detector. So by using this kind of interferometer, you can very precisely see whether this mirror has moved. And these things are moved in optic to see whether the mirror moves by like a part of the wavelength of the light. So a change by a nanometer is very, very easy to see with this. If I want to use this one now and think about gravitational waves, well, what a gravitational wave does, again due to Einstein, is it changes the metric, so it changes space which means if a gravitational wave passes through, it changes the distance between two points. Space gets bigger and smaller in a periodic fashion. So if I just take my interferometer 
and the distance to this mirror is not changing in time, I should be able to see this. I should be able to see like a phase coming out that's oscillating with this gravity wave. The trouble is you put numbers and you realize that, okay, hmm, first of all, the effect is there, but the effect is very, very, very tiny. Plus there's laser noise, short noise, and all of this, so it may take a bit of time. It turns out it took them 30, 40 years to build a device that works. It's called LIGO, the Laser Interferometric Gravita Gravitational Wave Observatory, and it basically looks like a Michaels interferometer. You have the laser coming in from the light, from the left, you have the beam split in the middle, and then on the path to the right, say, the light goes to this final mirror here, but then it bounces back, and here's another mirror which is partially reflective. So a lot of the light goes back and forth between these mirrors thousands and thousands of times before it then eventually goes to the detector. And that's nice, because if now this distance here is changed by a gravitational wave by a tiny amount, because the light goes around many, many times, it's amplified a lot. So it gets easier to measure. And then there's a couple of technical problems, so they had to like, develop special lasers, they had to think about how big do these arms have to be, and it turns out these arms should be like a couple of kilometers long, so they had to go and find a nice desert to build it in, which they found. And then they built an interferometer where you basically have these two arms going four kilometers one direction, four kilometers the other direction. And in fact, they didn't only build one, they built two of those. Because what happens now if you have a little bit of noise? If, say, somebody kicks the end mirror, and the end mirror is therefore bang, ringing around, then you see a signal in this interferometer. So the best thing is to build two of them, because all of the noise you see just in the one but not in the other interferometer, that's a local source, say a truck driving past. But if you see the same signal in both interferometers, it's a bang, gravitational wave. So they had to build two of those, and they had to put a lot of development into the, the details. So for instance, these mirrors had to be hyper-polished, and they had to be like taken up in a very specific manner that they like as much as they can be decoupled from like seismic backgrounds. You know the Earth is always shaking, you always have like these micro seismic events, like very, very small earthquakes that we don't even notice. But if you measure so, so, so precisely, you notice all of the little dirt that is there. So they had to like decouple the mirrors from the environment by really holding them on like very nice springs. And then in the end, they were able to measure something. And they were able to measure exactly the spiral of such a signal coming in. So this is now theory, what you would expect. Here's the waveform, so here's the signal that you see as a function of time. When you think about these two black holes, they're far outside, they start to spiral around each other, and they give a signal. And as they are thrown into each other, they start to like get closer and closer to each other. And because their angular momentum is conserved, it's like a, um, an ice skater, when they start to rotate and they pull their arms in, they start to rotate faster. So you see that going from here to now to here, you would see here towards the end that the frequency increases, the peaks get closer and closer and closer to each other. And they also get higher in amplitude because stuff gets pretty violent. And this here is now a zoom into the final part. This is like what they call the in-spiral, when they spiral towards each other. This is the merger, when they really touch and merge. And then afterwards you get a bigger black hole and you get a ring down where the signal decays away. That's what they expect. And here is what they saw. So this is the LIGO detector in Livingston in the US, and the upper one, which I can't reach, is the one in Hanford. And what you can really see here, this is time in seconds. Of course, this in-spiral has been going on for a cosmic time scale. Days, weeks, months, years, decades, who knows, very long time. But they can only see like the last 0.1 second, where the thing becomes really violent. That's all they can see, and then the signal dies away. And then, of course, they can go on and ask, OK, how can we make the system better? What is now the next thing for us to look at? And the next proposal they came up with is what they call advanced LIGO. And that's the detector that they're currently building. And one of the things that they really want to improve on now is to like, how do we like mount these mirrors? So what you see here is there's now a couple of, of very special springs, few silica fibers. There's like a whole shenanigans of a four segment pendulum to really decouple them as much as they can from the seismic things. And advanced LIGO is not yet operational, but here's like, what they believe will be their sensitivity. Like the strain is like how strong does the signal have to be that we can see it. The black line is the overall thing. And you can see that at 100 hertz, they get a very, very good sensitivity. But you see it gets very bad below something like 10 to the 1, below 10 hertz. And the reason for that is that if the frequencies get lower and lower and lower, the seismic noise gets more important. So I'm just showing this to say there is like a fundamental limit of what you can do with a laser because you have to have these mirrors. And these mirrors must be mounted in some way to the ground. So if the ground shakes, they shake with it. 
So, okay, now we can think about how can we go beyond this? How can we get this back to the atoms, where we finally want to end up with? So what do we do? Well, we have to realize that the atom's wave function by itself, the whole atom as a whole, will also be moving around in a certain fashion in space. And we know that normally we just describe them as a little billiard ball flying around on a straight line, a classical particle, like a football, just smaller. And if you want to define, for instance, what the atoms in the air around you do at room temperature, that's a perfectly fine and convenient description. Nothing wrong with it. However, fundamentally, quantum mechanics tells us that also the atoms, the center of mass motion of the atoms, will also be described as a wave, as a wave function. So it should be a little wave packet, a little like oscillations, waves going in. And it turns out, if I look at the wavelength that comes with this, that wavelength scales like one over the square root of the temperature. So at temperature big, wavelength very small, which means it's very, very tight, and I can't really see it, I can't resolve it, it looks like a little ball. If I make the atoms very slow, very cold, the wavelength gets bigger, and I start to be able to observe these effects. So this is like an example that I showed in a previous talk. Um, when you take two cold clouds, which are very, very cold, let them expand so that they overlap, and then you measure the density of the atoms, you do see these interference fringes, maxima and minima, uh, constructive and destructive interference. So it directly proves to you that the atoms really behave like a matter wave. And if the atoms behave like a wave, then you can build an interferometer with them. So the idea of these matter wave interferometers is that you take like, your atoms coming in, say it's a blue line here from the left, and then you hit them with a laser pulse that does one of those pi over two pulses that I explained when I talked about the atomic clock. So you create a superposition of the atom being in the ground state and being excited. So it's kind of like half swinging when you think this back to the swing. And then the one part travels on the blue path, the other on the wet path, and then later on with more, with more and more pulses you can recombine them, and then you can measure the phase. And you can have constructive or destructive interference in the same way as you could measure out the Michelson interferometer on the optical side. So you see those, and you see whether the phase has changed between these two paths or not. And the way you do this is that you do this while the atoms are free falling. So you take a bunch of atoms, you accelerate them upwards, throw them upwards, and then while they're flying up and down again, you hit them with those laser pulses. And because the atoms are in free fall the whole time, can take like a second or two seconds, because they're in free fall, they're not really coupled to the vibrations of the ground around them, because they're just in free fall. So they're not sensitive to these vibrations, so we get around the sensitivity limit that you had with the lasers. The problem, of course, is when you think back to the clocks, I was telling you for the second pulse, if I want to excite them, I have to push exactly in the right phase. If I'm out of phase, because the laser is noisy, then I have a problem. So the laser noise is a big issue here. And that's why people for a long time thought, OK, well, this is a neat concept, but it's not viable, because lasers will never be that perfect. However, then about 10 years ago, somebody had a clever idea. Somebody said, and now we're coming back to my title slide, let me build the following detector. Let me take a long vertical vacuum tube, put my atoms down here, excite them up and back down, and hit them with the laser which travels along this, way, this main line. And what you then do is, you take like a second atom source, two stories up, and do the same thing there. So you have two interferometers, one down here, one up here. And both interferometers are affected by the laser noise. But they're affected by the laser noise in exactly the same way, because it's the same laser beam. What this now means is that if I look at the difference between the measurements, I do a differential readout, as we call it, the laser noise drops out. So we have solved our problem that we really are, can now do these measurements without having this, um, having to worry about the laser noise. And that's what we're trying to do. Of course, because we're now only sensitive to the gradient, to the difference between up and down, the more we can separate them, the longer we make this baseline, the better off we are. And okay, this is not just schematically, you have like this two interferometers, details don't matter, and there is now a consortium in the UK, it's called Aeon, Atom Interferometric Network and Observatory, which is building those things. We're building Aeon 1, already in the labs, I show you pictures, Aeon 10, we are just tomorrow have like the final meeting on agreeing on the costs of this, and hopefully we'll start to build it in uh, next year, March or April. Then we want to go to Aeon 100, which is like a 100 meter version, which you can't put in the building, you have to put it in a mine shaft, and I'll show you pictures of this in a few minutes. And then later on we want to go to like a kilometer scale, and ultimately put this on two satellites, where the two atoms can be like tens of thousands of kilometers apart. But that's past my retirement age, so we'll talk a bit less about that one. Okay, 
So we are not doing this ourselves. We're not doing this with like a group of five, 10 people. We're doing this with a big consortium. This was an old picture, 70 people. Now we're like probably above 100 people working together on building this. There's a couple of issues along the way which I just mentioned in passing. One is if I take my atoms, I shoot them up, they fly say five meters up and fall back down, that will take a couple of seconds, just free fall. Which of course means that if they have a finite velocity, and because they must be free during this time, they can't be trapped in any way, they will fly out and expand. So the cloud gets bigger. And if my laser beam has only a finite size, I have to be careful that the cloud doesn't get bigger than the laser beam so that the interferometry doesn't matter anymore. So what I have to do is I have to cool the atoms down a lot. I have to get down to something like pico Kelvin temperatures such that the thermal velocities are so small that they're still in the laser beam after two seconds, which is challenging but kind of doable. Uh, now, how can I really measure gravitational waves with this? Well, it's like what we did with the, with the, atom inter the optical interferometry. Right? We said that basically the distance between these two atomic sources will change when the gravitational wave goes through. That means that the phase that the laser picks up while traveling from here to there will change. So we get then the differential phase between the two interferometers. And we can put in numbers and we can say, well, okay, hmm, this looks very nice, but you have to measure a phase of 10 to the minus 12 of a full circle in order to be able to see something. And that seems to be a bit too small to observe this. The optical interferometers got around this by saying, okay, we just take this big laser beam, the two mirrors, and it goes back and forth a hundred times. Can we do the same thing with the atoms? And the answer, interestingly, is yes, we can. That's called large momentum transfer, where you hit the atoms not with just one laser pulse, but with like hundreds of laser pulses, and therefore they separate off much, much bigger, and they like measure the phase of the laser 100 or 10,000 times, and you get the same amplification effect. So all of this looks doable. It has a lot of technical challenges, but it's on the way of being created. And then this is the plot that get, got us the money for doing this. What you see here is the sensitivity that we expect compared to other measurements. So the vertical axis is the sensitivity. Smaller numbers are better. This axis here is the frequency. How fast does the gravitational wave oscillate? And this is the regime that LIGO uh, is doing at the moment. And this is what they believe with the Einstein telescope they want to be able to do in like a few years, 10 years, 20 years time. On the other hand, we have this green area over there, which is called LISA. This is like laser interferometry in space, two satellites, pretty expensive. And what they believe they can be do. And they will work at very, very lower frequencies. And the important point for us is that there's a big gap here in the middle. And this gap is where like atom kilometers, this purple line, where we will be able to, manage, to measure. And now one can ask, why is this particularly interesting? Well, if you follow the line of an event, let me take this line because I can reach it. This is like the line of the signal that you expect for one pair of inspiraling black holes. This point here is when they're like 10 years away from being merged. And then they will spiral in, they get faster, this is a year away, a month away, a day away, an hour away, it gets faster, faster, faster. And then the amplitude increases ever so slightly and then it drops away. This is the merger. So what LIGO is able to measure is this last couple of seconds that we just saw. Well, LIGO was measuring 0.1 seconds. Einstein telescope can measure a few seconds. And that gives you access to this part. But the really, really great thing that you can do with the atoms is that if you can measure this like an hour and a day and a month before, you can precisely predict when this will happen. And if you take like a couple of those things around the Earth, you can also precisely predict where in the sky it will happen. And then suddenly you can go to your friends at the James Webb Telescope, the Hubble Telescope, and tell them, look in this direction tomorrow afternoon. And that's what call, what's called multi-messenger astronomy, where we can tell them and we can observe the same event in like, um, with various different means. So now I've closed the loop. I went from the small things to the very big things and told you how you can use atoms to really observe things in the cosmos on cosmic scales and how you can really use this to like also take the other techniques you already have to point them in the right direction at the right point in time. And I should probably stop here and we'll just say one more slide, which is to say that another big interesting thing that would take another 10 minutes to explain in detail, so we don't do this, is that there's also dark matter. People know from cosmology that the universe should be made up of 80 to 85% of dark matter, so matter that doesn't glow, doesn't emit light, doesn't interact with light, so it's gotta be there, but we can't see it. However, if that light interacts ever, ever so feebly and weakly with normal matter, 
you can ask again, what is the best way of measuring it? And it turns out exactly the same at the metaphorometers that I've just explained, are also very sensitive to this. So they are also like in certain parameter regimes, so-called ultralight dark matter, the best shot that we have at the moment of ever detecting those things. So now mindful, I'm not necessarily saying it exists, but I'm saying it's very worth looking for it. And I think that's kind of like the final thing here. We don't necessarily have to know what we expect when we look more carefully, but because the atoms are really susceptible to everything in the universe and they, may, they see everything, if we just measure careful enough, we will see something. And that's maybe the end of it for today. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Ulrich. So, some absolutely fascinating things there. And I, I'm particularly taken by that story you told us on the name mm -hmm. of, you know, we spent ages looking here and here. And it just hadn't occurred to us to look slightly beyond. And it, in some ways, it's amazing in scientific experiments how often that happens, that it's when people look in the place that nobody was looking uh, that you get somewhere. Um, we have a number of questions already in from online, but I think I might start with a question or two in the audience. So if there are any questions, please do just put a hand up. Uh, and one of the team will bring a mic to you. Um, while you're settling on them, let me start off with a question from Garth Wilkinson. Um, you went talked about cesium atoms. Mm -hmm. How do you know cesium atoms are the same throughout the cosmos? How can we be sure that they're not mm -hmm. slightly different somewhere else? Fair enough. Um, short answer is we don't. Strong answer is we assume they are. Because when I look at everything on Earth, all of the cesium atoms we've ever seen, they are all, if they're the same isotope, they are all precisely the same, up to the 20 digits or 16 digits we can measure. We have never ever found any atom that's like just a fraction of. We found atoms with a different isotope, which are then a different class, and they're very different, but not in the same class of things. We also can look at those lines that we see in the sun. We can also see those lines that are coming from different stars, look at them, and by also seeing how those lines get shifted, redshift, the further they go away from us, we know how the cosmos expands, we can measure the velocities. So we have no indication of looking, of seeing that cesium atoms can be different somewhere else. It's a little bit the same thing. We wouldn't be doing physics if we wouldn't assume that all of the laws of nature that are there today will also be there tomorrow. What we assume, the homotopy of space and the homogeneity of time, otherwise everything is pointless because everything we do now has no bearing on tomorrow. So we assume that the laws are the same and one of the laws is that the cesium atoms are all the same. Any questions here? There's one at the front. Uh, thank you. You finished with uh, dark matter, so I have a question about this. Uh, so uh, I was told that dark matter is some uh, missing mass that we haven't mm -hmm. accounted for in the universe mm -hmm. and we don't know what it is. Mm -hmm. But since we discover more and more black holes all the time, could it mm -hmm. be that, that this missing mass is simply black holes that are mm -hmm. unaccounted for yet? Mm -hmm. uh, very good question, and I should say that I'm not a cosmologist. I work with cold atoms, so I know a lot about this technology and a bit less about the dark matter and the uh, black holes. Uh, what I've been told is that if you would have black holes of a certain size and they would make up all of this missing dark matter, black holes, they act like gravi gravitational lenses. So if the light goes around them, it gets bent around because of the gravity of the black hole, and you can see this. So if you have a big black hole, you can see that the galaxies behind that look distorted. And if you just do a survey of this kind, you look how many of those areas you find where you have this, what they call microlensing, it doesn't account for the numbers. So therefore, it's unlikely. So there's a, a question from Sandra Bristol who says, why can't we block the gravitational force like we can the electromagnetic force? Is this a technological limit or a fundamental limit? It's a fundamental limit. So if we have, for instance, electrical charges, we have a positive charge, you can like block it by putting a negative charge around it. But because gravity only is always attractive, you don't have like a different charge of gravity, there's no way how you can counteract it. If you think of magnetic uh, moments, you have the North Pole and the South Pole, so you can compensate the one with the other, but gravity is always attractive, so you can't do that. If we found some sort of anti-gravity, that might be different. That would change quite a few things. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't have my hopes up. <laughs> Next year's lecture, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions in the audience? Um, There's one here. Oh, sorry, where? 
You said that <laughs> atoms are, are affected by everything. Um, yes. Gravitational waves, electric, yes. magnetic, whatever. Yes. How do you know what it is that's actually affecting it when you're trying to measure it? Mm -hmm. That's always a $10 million question. Um, you have to be, do very many careful control experiments. So by looking at the effect of an electric field, we can like, calculate, we can measure how big this effect is because we can put like, two plates around them and put the atoms in the plate capacitor, and then we can turn up the voltage and measure the effect. And then we can measure the effect on the negative side, and we can see whether we get a line that goes nicely through zero at zero, or if the line is shifted up or down. Then we know we have a background field. So you can do many things like this. But for instance, an interesting question is when you talk about gravity, how do you know that it's really the effect of a gravitational wave and not the effect of like a car passing by in front of your building? And that's a funny question. We believe we have an answer, but the answer is pretty complicated. It takes a lot of computer simulations and many, many things to take this into account. We believe the kilometer sensor will be, or even the 10 meter sensor should be um, sensitive enough to measure the gravity of a rat running around five meters away from the detector. Not to say that the physics building has rats, but if they would have, <laughs> you would see them. <laughs> I seem to remember there were some problems at CERN where they had, they had a lot of results which actually correlated with a new tram timetable. Yes. A uh, rather yes. experiment. So, so I think there was a bottle that was left in the beam path at one stage. There is many effects like this, yes. Um, you know, I, you, know you, you think you found some brilliant new physics, and it turns out someone yes. left a beer bottle in the way. Not quite, yes. not quite the same. Yes. Um, uh, another question here. You've talked, I, I don't, and I wouldn't want anybody to dismiss the importance of fundamental physics, mm -hmm. but what are the practical applications of this? The practical applications of atomic clocks, I think, are numerous, and the biggest one is GPS. GPS would not work without atomic clocks. And if you put like, better clocks up there, we can lack better sensitivity and all of that. On gravitational waves, well, at the moment, it's more fundamental, I would say. Um, one of our regular pe uh, people is, is anonymous attendee. They come to a lot of our events. Mm -hmm. um, and, and they ask, what exactly happens when two black holes meet? Good question. The only thing that we know about it at the moment, I believe, are that they emit gravitational waves. And they end up being a bigger gravitational a bigger black hole with like both masses combined. Okay. Anyone else here? There's somebody up there, and then I'll come to a couple more from online. <laughs> Just going back to the answer to uh, a question a second ago, are you implying that you're <laughs> going to be able to, to run um, as a single site experiment without a, a differential somewhere? Um, Aeon can run as a single experiment because Aeon already has the differential built in, right? It has already two interferometers and one apparatus. The thing is, it's, I mean, the first idea that people had with this kind of, kind of thing, say, okay, let me take like an atomic clock here, one optical fiber by 100 kilometers and put a second clock there and interrogate them with the same laser. The problem is that all of the noise the, the fiber picks up in between, that screws you. Similar thing, if you say, okay, I want to like send the laser beam free space from here to here, the index of refraction of air depends on the density, the humidity, and the, de and, uh, and the pressure of the air. Because you have weather, you have these fluctuations, this turbulent motion of the air, it also generates too much phase noise. So the only way you can do it is you have to like, make a vacuum pipe that goes from here to there, that the, the laser light all the time runs through vacuum. And then it turns out that it's the easiest for us to put them on top of each other and not like this. Um, Andy asks, or says, I vaguely remember Heisenberg. Yes. When you measure some property extremely precisely, aren't you changing the nature of another property? Uh, yes and no. Very so Heisenbergian answer. <laughs> so what, Heisenberg, what the Heisenberg uncertainty relation is a very fundamental uh, relationship. And it has, like, say, there's conjugated pairs of things, like the momentum and the position of a particle. And if I measure the one very precisely, the other one is very imprecisely known. So I'm not, measuring, not changing the nature of it. It's just like I'm changing the knowledge that I have about it. Okay, anyone in the room up, up there? And that, we can bring in questions right at the top as well if there's, you know, just wave. Uh, first of all, thank you very much. Very interesting thank lecture. Um, I, I don't want to be cheeky. I feel you may have slightly dodged the online question about practical applications. <laughs> um, I appreciate there may be no immediate mm -hmm. practical applications which we can discern mm -hmm. at the moment, but it's fairly common knowledge that, for example, uh, the internet came out of all the work at, at CERN. Yeah. Um, so what I would like is to invite any 
speculation or mm -hmm. prophecy, if you will. <laughs> what do you think might come out of some of this stuff? Because at the moment, being able mm -hmm. to forecast when a, a couple of black mm -hmm. holes will merge and then direct James Webb to have a look at it, that's going to be cool. That's going to mm -hmm. make some nice pictures yep. on the news. But it's very just true. improving GPS, that, that's a bit... GPS is fairly good at the moment, but what we need got me to Cambridge. <laughs> uh, okay, so let me say two answers to this. The first one is that the internet came out of CERN, yes, but CERN was not going in there with a definition of saying we want to now build an internet. We are developing a lot of quantum technologies here that, that will have like site uses. So we are, for instance, developing better laser systems which will also be used for like better molecular spectroscopy that might help in biomedical, that might help in bioimaging, and many, many things like this. The other thing is also like a lot of what we do, and also where most of our money goes, is into people, into training people, into training PhD students, and training them for like all, doing all kinds of quantum things. And whether they have now worked on something that where they wanted to build a quantum computer, or whether they want to build like controlling the atoms for an atom interferometer. It's the same underlying techniques that they've learned and they can go on in this growing quantum industry, which is really booming at the moment. And at the moment, we have a very hard time retaining postdocs because the industry is paying them so much more than we can. So I think there's a big market for more people being trained in this area. But I think there's also a point for fundamental physics. There's also a point for just like us as humans having this very general uh, wish to understand our world, wish to understand our world also beyond what is directly useful, just like for aesthetic reasons. So we want to understand how the cosmos works. We want to understand how subatomic particles work. And I think it's totally fair to say we want to like, have a certain amount of resource going into this. Like we want to have a certain amount of resource going into arts, humanities, and many, many other things without us always having to say this is going to be useful here and there. I mean, there's limits to this, but a certain amount of resources should go into fundamental physics. Um, lots of questions flooding in online. Um, Paul Klein from ARU says, if atoms are sensitive to unknown physics, could Aeon offer insight into dark energy also, or is this just science fiction? I think Garth Wilkinson also asked about dark energy. Uh -huh. so. Yes, okay, so... Um, dark energy is even less defined what it actually is than what dark matter is. For like, people that have not heard the term before, we know there's the expansion of the universe, and we would expect that this expansion should slow down over time because the universe just gets less and less dense. But we seem to see that the universe over the last, I don't know, whatever time, has started to accelerate faster again. So the natural question then is, what is driving this faster acceleration? And then people have no idea. They just coined that thing dark energy. So that's all we know about dark energy. And there's a couple of theories for dark energy which say it has consequences that are predictable and that are measurable. And something like Aeon could detect those. But if we don't detect those, it just means that this particular model, or this particular theory is off. It doesn't say anything about the other possible theory. So that's very, very speculative. So it's the stuff we don't really know anything about. Exactly, yeah. I, I used to work in genomics. We used to talk about junk DNA. Mm -hmm. uh, we've now revised that as really important stuff we don't yet understand. Yes. Uh, after discovering yeah. that it did matter. Yeah. yeah. Uh, any more in the room? There's one right at the back there. And then one up at here. It's uh, an application of your uh, the a, a wave, uh, for, mm -hmm. but you said at the beginning that every element has a, a ultraviolet light, a different length. So if you get a chemical reaction between two elements, can you measure the speed within these two elements will react to, with each other? Yes, you can use spectroscopy, time-dependent time spectroscopy to measure like the kinetics of chemical reaction, how fast things happen and so on. The only thing that you have to be careful with is that by illuminating the atoms with that light, you do change what they're doing. One of the consequences of this uncertainty relation is that in quantum mechanics, you cannot ne never just observe something. If you measure something, you influence the system. And maybe it's also easy to understand this. If you say you have a car, and now you want to measure where the car is, you shine light to the car, the, car, the light gets reflected, and you see that light, and you see there's the car. Because the light is, has a little pressure, but not much, and the car is so big, that it doesn't noticeably change the amount of how fast the, light, the, the, the car moves. However, if I take my atom, as you see in the interferometer, if I hit them with the light that they absorb or emit, that kicks the atoms onto another trajectory. And that we can use to like the meta wave optics to like move the atoms around as we need them. But that also means there's no free lunch, 
That means I cannot just hit them with light while they're doing a reaction and expect them to do the same thing that they would have done without the light. Because my observation is already so big and so important that it changes the physics. And that's like the spirit of what Heisenberg meant. You can't just observe something without changing it. However, if the system you're observing is big enough, then the change is so minuscule that you don't care. But if you look at something microscopically small, you will always make like a noticeable difference. A question over here. Do you think there might be a time in a probably very distant future where we'll, we'll know all physics? There will be nothing else to discover at some point? Uh, I obviously don't have a proper answer, but my gut feeling is no. There was like a very interesting uh, statement by somebody working as a, in, in, as a patent officer in the beginning of the, in the late 19th century, beginning of 20th century, who was basically resigning from his post, saying, look, we have Maxwell, Maxwell's equation, we now understand thermodynamics, we understand mechanics. I resign, there is not going to be any new inventions. We have understood everything there is to be understood. And then, of course, you had Einstein, you had Bohr, you had quantum, and you felt it just started. So the fact that we can't foresee what will come next doesn't mean it will not come. Um, a few more questions from online then. Um, Taylor Briggs uh, asked for a bit more information about how atoms can be used as quantum sensors for dark matter. Mm -hmm. What atomic fluctuations would signify the existence of dark matter? Uh -huh. It's not as if I wouldn't have another 10 slides on this. Um, <laughs> 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 so the, uh, i just go to one slide. The upshot is that if dark matter couples to normal matter, in the way that we think it should, then it will change, for instance, things like the electron mass and the fine structure constant in a very, very slight way, which basically means that the oscillating dark matter field, and I realize I haven't under under explained why it should be an oscillating field, will slightly change the resonance frequency of the atoms. So it will modulate the atom frequency in time by something that's so tiny that so far nobody could detect it. But if you measure precisely enough and the effect exists, you should see it. There you go, Taylor. Slides and everything. <laughs> Any more questions in the room? Um, why is there more dark matter than normal matter? Anonymous attendee this time, I'm afraid. Yeah, we have no idea. I mean, why do we believe that dark matter exists? If you look at, for instance, galaxies that rotate, and you ask how fast do they rotate on the inside or on the outside, then, of course, if something is rotating, you have the centrifugal force, which means stuff wants to fly away. It's counteracted in the galaxy by everything being held together by gravity. So by looking at how the, gravity, the, 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 the galaxy rotates, you kind of have an idea of how much mass must be in the galaxy for having gravitational forces of the strength that we see. And by this, we realize that if the law of gravity that we use is the right one, then we are missing something like 80 to 85% of the mass. So that's why we believe where this number comes from. Any final questions? Can I ask, what, what got you into this? Why were you excited by ultra-cold and ultra-huge? <laughs> the answer will surprise you, or maybe not. When I was uh, a student at A-levels, I was very much into music. So I was playing instruments, and I was like, also working as a sound engineer. And then I felt like, OK, I'm maybe not good enough as an instrumentalist to like, really make my living out of this. So I want to like, do sound. When I, like, build better amplifiers, better sound systems, and what you dream of as a 17-year-old. And then you got into this and you felt like, okay, maybe I should study physics because they really look at the fundamentals of this. And these wave phenomena are very interesting. And I just moved on from sounds to lasers to meta wave and to everything. Simple as that. <laughs> okay, so, 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 oh, one question right here at the front. So. I won't make the comments I was going to make about, you know, if you can't make it as a musician, you become a professor in Cambridge. Of physics. <laughs> so it's relating to your sound. Um, I, I've been wondering whether um, with these gravitational waves and interferences, whether they have a particular sound that's identifiable to the gravitational wave and if that helps you identify it and prevent it from all the disturbances like the rats or the trains yeah. or <laughs> so whether you can associate a, very... a specific sound to the <laughs> yes so uh, section I, of the wave. I wouldn't say sound because the frequency we're looking at is like below one hertz so it's like below the frequencies you can audible here um, but yes exactly if i have this kind of spiral things i'm looking for a signal that's there for a long time and it's slowly getting faster and that's why a rat is not a big problem because a rat will come in once and go away it will be a very irregular system so if we do fourier filtering the rat can be very easily filtered out and many other things as well. 
the things that are slightly tricky for us, which we are actually had like a workshop the whole day about, where we were talking to the earth scientists and the seismologists, is like what is the effect of the, the spectrum of waves at the ocean? Because they're also like in this kind of frequency range and they're there all the time, sometimes stronger, sometimes weaker. How can we distinguish those? And the answer is there is ideas, but they're too complicated to explain here. <laughs> Fantastic. In which case, thank you very much for an absolutely brilliant talk, Ulrich. Thank you very much for being here. And that's all we have time for tonight. And it's also the end of our contribution to the Cambridge Festival. So whether you've just been to this event or to some of the others, you know, thank you very much. Come again next year for the Cambridge Festival events. But we have a lot more here at Jesus College and the Intellectual Forum after we take a couple of weeks break um, over Easter. So when we come back, we have one of our visiting fellows, Claire Gilbert, talking about her book about Julian of Norwich, going back slightly further in history. We have Ai Weiwei, the dissident artist, talking about uh, some of his work about memorials, colonization, and freedom in art. We'll be hearing from the chief executive of Compassion World Farming about how we can think about carbon emissions and food and what we can do to perhaps grow protein and grow um, meat artificially. And there's a lot more still to come. So hopefully see you again in person or online. Enjoy the rest of your evenings.